So my name's Will. I, I work for a graph database company called Near4j. And what I want to talk about today is how we can really abstract away the database with GraphQL so we don't have to think and work with the database as much. Because really, we're trying to build our application. We're not necessarily trying to work with a database. Um, so I did recently just, just publish this book, Full Stack GraphQL Applications. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail about a couple of the things we're going to talk about today. So if that's interesting, um, my employer sponsored the full book, so you can download a PDF of it for free at dev.nature.com slash GraphQL dash book. So I want to talk a little bit about Near4j. That, that 4j is for JavaScript, by the way. Anyone used Near4j before? A few folks? OK, cool. So Near4j is a, a graph database. So what that means is, like other databases, like relational databases, document databases, the data model is not tables or documents. The data model is a graph. And we're going to talk, talk a lot about what a graph is uh, and how that relates to, to GraphQL. Um, we use, specifically use this data model called the property graph data model. Um, we'll talk about what that is. And we use a query language called Cypher. Uh, there are lots of interesting things you can do with graphs and graph databases from things like data science and analytics. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is more of the transactional and building an API for my web application type use cases. Uh, this is an example of a Cypher query. You can think of it as kind of like SQL, but for graphs. And Cypher is really all about this idea of pattern matching. So on the first line, you can see we're drawing this sort of ASCII art representation of a graph. These parentheses, so like around address, we're sort of drawing a node uh, that has the label address. And then these arrows represent relationships that are connecting them. So this query says, find uh, addresses that are in New York and find uh, officers connected to them and then find legal entities connected to those officers. So for everyone that has an address in New York, what are, in this case, the offshore corporations connected to them. This query comes from uh, the Panama Papers investigation uh, a few years ago, which was looking at offshore companies and influential people connected to them. Uh, the data journalists, the ICIJ, used Near4j to make sense of that data. Um, that data is public, which is an interesting one to play around with. Um, I, I like to use this slide just, again, to kind of reiterate that point uh, of what I mentioned earlier, where there are lots of interesting things we can do with graphs from uh, analytics on the right side all the way over to the more transactional operational workloads. I'm building an API for my web application. And so that's where we're going to be today over on the left side, building GraphQL APIs for our web apps, our mobile apps, whatever. So let's talk about graphs. So at a fundamental level, this is a graph. A graph is a data structure. Nodes are the entities, relationships connect them. There are a few different flavors of graphs out there. I mentioned earlier this idea of the property graph data model. So this just means that I have labels that describe the type of node that I have. You can think of that as like a table from a relational database, a way to group my entities. And then relationships connect these nodes, but I can store key value pair properties. These are the attributes, the, the individual data points on both nodes and relationships. You may also hear the term knowledge graph um, talk a lot about. I, I think a knowledge graph, the way I think of it is really just an implementation of a property graph. So I have a graph with some real data in it that describes how things are connected. So putting things in context. So in this case, this is an example from uh, New York Times articles. So for each article, I know the topics that it's about. I know the geo areas that it's mentioning. Um, I know other articles of that same topic. I have the context of what's going on here. That's really a knowledge graph. So uh, for the rest of this talk, we're going to use this data as an example. This data comes from the New York Times API. Um, I think like over a year ago, I set up a, a daily cron just to grab 
the top articles for the day, store them in a database. Um, bit of an aside, I, I use GitHub Actions to do that. Anyone using GitHub Actions for kind of like super easy, lazy ETL um, is something I, I discovered. There's this action called Flat, uh, which basically allows you to set up a cron job, go out to a database, or in this case, a, a REST API endpoint, fetch some data, stick it in a database. Uh, don't have to worry about it. But anyway, uh, all the code is in this GitHub repo. Okay, so let's say we're building a newsreader application. Um, this is a, a web application, iPhone, whatever. Um, how do I want to fetch this data for my application? Well, we, we, we talked a little bit about Cypher and graph databases. GraphQL is also an option out there. How do I sort of architect my application? Um, let's talk a little bit about GraphQL. Who's used GraphQL before? A lot of folks. Anyone built a, a GraphQL server before? A few folks. Okay, cool. So GraphQL is an API query language and a runtime for building those APIs. So this means that with GraphQL, we start by describing the data. These are our GraphQL type definitions. So we're describing the data available in the API uh, and how that data is connected. This is the graph part of GraphQL. So for example, here we have the project type. We have names a string, tagline is a string, and then we have a list of contributors. Those are users. That's a reference to this user type. That's the graph part. Uh, then at query time, the client is free to ask for whatever piece of that graph, whatever piece of that data graph uh, they need to render the view in the application, whatever they need the data for. And then because we have these type definitions, that's the schema of our API, we know exactly what data we're getting back. So I built a GraphQL API for this news application. Um, it's running here on Vercel. So here we can, this is GraphQL Playground. If you haven't seen this before, it's powered by the introspection functionality of GraphQL that allows us to go to a GraphQL endpoint and say, hey, what kind of data do you have? Let's build some documentation for that. Or in our developer tools, let's build uh, autocomplete this sort of functionality. So I can look and see what are all of the entry points. Uh, these are called queries. We don't have any mutations, so this is a read-only API. But I can see the type of data I can ask for uh, and what I get back. So here we were looking for articles that are connected to exercise that, have, that mention some geolocation and give me the 10 most recent. We can see I get back uh, exactly what I'm asking for title URL published, and then also I want to know what are the geos connected to the article. And I get those for each one. And if I want, in my view, maybe to render more information, I can just add that to my query here. So maybe for each of these geo regions, uh, maybe I want the most recent uh, articles. So let's just say... Give me three, and give me the title. So you can see I get this nice autocomplete uh, since our tooling here, GraphQL Playground, knows the schema. And now my query returns articles, three articles now for each geo uh, mentioned. So that's super quick look at GraphQL. Let's take a look at how we would do something like this in Cypher with Neo4j. So we have the same data in Neo4j. This is Neo4j browser, which is like a query workbench for Neo4j. Here's a query that says find articles that have a topic and then give me uh, the 50 most recent sorted by date published. And we can see here the article nodes are this salmon color, the topics are green. So here's an article, something about uh, parenting. I can kind of double click to expand here and I can see sort of as I'm traversing the graph, uh, my data. Okay, so that's a look at, I guess, sort of the developer tooling around uh, GraphQL and Cypher. Let's talk a little bit about what these are and how they're different. So 
Cypher, we said, is, is this graph database query language. You can think of it as like SQL, but for graphs, all about pattern matching. It's very declarative. We're drawing this ASCII art representation. We have all the, the functionality you would expect from a database query language, things like aggregations, math functions, and then lots of graph-specific things for working with paths, relationships, these sorts of things. If we compare that to GraphQL, well, we said GraphQL is a query language for APIs, not for databases. Um, we have this idea of this strict type system that describes the data, how it's connected. Um, we think of this in terms of the data graph. So GraphQL is fundamentally treating our application data as a graph. And we can really build GraphQL APIs on top of any backend, and we have a, a similar idea of traversing the graph uh, like we do in Cypher through a nested selection set. So in our Cypher, in our GraphQL query, when we added articles now for each geo, that's traversing the graph using this nested selection set. So let's look at a couple of examples for some queries to see uh, how these two are different. So show me all the articles in Cypher, we describe a, a graph pattern using that ASCII art representation. So here, find all article nodes, return those. In GraphQL, well, in our uh, API that we built, we have an articles query, uh, and then we can return, maybe we just need title and abstract. Give me the 10 most recent. Well, in Cypher, we have order by, we have limit. Uh, so order by publish date, give me 10. Um, this sort of functionality is not built into GraphQL. We have to design that as we're designing our API. We can use field arguments to accomplish that. So here we have an options argument on our root query. So we're gonna say sort by publish descending, limit 10. Okay, now a little bit more complex of a traversal. So now for all of those 10 most recent articles, also give me their topics. Well, in Cypher, I add on to my graph pattern here. So I draw a relationship that's going out now to the topic nodes. And in GraphQL, well, I just add to my nested selection set. So here now I'm adding topics, and then for each topic, give me their name. But these are both describing uh, similar ideas of traversing through this data graph. And we can keep going arbitrarily complex patterns. So now, in addition to those topics, show me other articles in those topics, we add more to our graph pattern here. And in GraphQL, we just continue nesting our selection set to traverse the data graph. Here's one that's a bit more complicated, though. Um, what's the shortest path from uh, two organizations, the National Park Service to the FAA? Well, in Cypher, because Cypher is built for querying and traversing graphs, we have a shortest path function that can take uh, a description of a graph pattern. And in this case, the key here is this asterisk in our brackets that is indicating a variable length path. So this is saying, find where this path connecting these two nodes, the National Park Service and the FAA, find where this exists in the graph, uh, but then do a breadth first search to make sure that's the shortest path and follow as many relationships deep as you have to go. And we end up with, um, overlapping topic on shortages. So a couple of articles about both of these organizations talking about worker shortages. Um, so it ends up being a, a pretty short path. In GraphQL, we don't have this sort of concept of shortest path or variable length path operator built into GraphQL. We could, of course, expose this functionality by adding a field that in the resolver has this sort of logic, but it's not really built in. Similarly, uh, a common use case for Graph database is computing recommendations. So a simple way to do that would be to look at uh, overlapping information about an article. So what are articles uh, that have similar authors about the same geo regions and the same topics? That might be a good recommendation. GraphQL doesn't have that sort of functionality built in, but again, we could add that sort of functionality by implementing a field that has that sort of logic. So GraphQL can actually be pretty flexible. So as we go back to thinking, okay, how do we architect our application? What does that look like? Well, it's pretty clear that GraphQL 
wants to sit in between the client and the database is the API layer. We don't want to just expose our database and all of this functionality to the world. We want to have custom logic, authorization, caching, things like that in the API layer. So how do we build this GraphQL service? Well, the typical way we do this is we start with GraphQL type definitions. Uh, we use something called the schema definition language, which we'll, we'll look at in an exam, uh, example in a second. Then we have to implement what are called resolver functions for each field for each type that has the logic for going to the data layer and fetching that data from a database, from another API, updating the data if it's a mutation, whatever that logic is. And then we need to serve that schema over some networking layer. So here's an example uh, on the left some type definitions. This is for a, uh, an app show uh, that was for a, a conference, so showing information about sessions and speakers uh, in the API at the conference. And then on the right, we have some resolver functions. And this is using kind of an ORM type syntax. So here we're searching for sessions by some search string. But then for every session that we find, we then have to go back to the database and say, oh, what room was that in? Oh, and what's the theme of that session? And then we have some custom logic for computing recommendations. And we have to go back to the database each time to compute those for every session that matches our search string. Um, this is what's called the n plus one query problem, where I'm going back to the data layer multiple times for each record that kind of matches my first uh, initial resolver. Uh, and this is a result of how resolvers are called in this nested fashion. So these are some common problems that come up as we're building GraphQL APIs, this n plus one query problem. There's a lot of boilerplate code that we write uh, in these resolver functions. So for this reason, uh, there are lots of interesting tools out there that can help uh, make working with GraphQL uh, easier with databases. One of those is the Neo4j GraphQL library. This is a JavaScript library for building GraphQL APIs uh, backed by Neo4j. So this works with any JavaScript GraphQL implementation. Basically, what we do is we take your GraphQL type definitions that define your data, and we generate an API, and then at query time, generate database queries so you don't need to implement any of those resolvers. So for example, uh, here's some GraphQL type definitions. Note that we've added some schema directives. So schema directives, uh, like this one, exclude operations, relationship, type direction. These are GraphQL's built-in extension mechanism. So this is saying, hey, there's some custom logic that's going to happen here. Someone in your server, GraphQL server implementation needs to, to handle that. And the reason we add relationship here is to encode the relationship type and direction uh, that we have in the property graph model that isn't really encoded in GraphQL. So this is sort, sort of becomes metadata to help drive the database model. And that's exactly what we do, is we take these type definitions to define the database data model. And then we add a bunch of things, uh, query mutation fields for each type by default, things like the ordering, pagination, complex filtering, um, support for the geotypes in the database, these sorts of things that you don't want to necessarily add uh, manually. Then at query time, the library will inspect the incoming GraphQL request and generate a single database query, so in this case a single cipher query, that can make a single round trip to the database to fetch just the data that the GraphQL query is asking for. So this is addressing that n plus one query problem. So that's great for sort of basic CRUD functionality. How do we handle custom logic here? Well, we can always implement our own resolvers in GraphQL that has code that defines our custom logic. But if we can express our custom logic in a database query in Cypher, we can leverage, again, GraphQL's built-in extension mechanism, these uh, schema directives, and specifically there's one called Cypher that allows us to basically bind a field in our GraphQL schema to a Cypher query. So in this case, we're adding uh, a similar field on the article type that's going to use some graph data science magic to 
generate uh, personalized recommendations for this article that the user is looking at. So if you're looking at this article, here's some other similar articles you might be interested in. So let's take a look at an example. So here is the exact same GraphQL API we were looking at earlier, hosted on Vercel. Um, that happens to be using the Neo4j GraphQL library. Let's take a look. Here's our schema. So here are our type definitions. We saw a screenshot of these earlier, but we have articles, authors, topics, persons, and so on. And we use these schema directives to kind of help configure what we're generating uh, in the API. And here's the code. There, we're pulling in uh, the Neo4j JavaScript driver, so pointing it at uh, a Neo4j instance. We're reading that schema.graphql file, and we're passing those type definitions and the driver instance to the Neo4j GraphQL library, then passing that off to Apollo. So that's all the code. We didn't have to write any resolver functions that defines how that logic is uh, fetched from the database. That's all generated for us at query time. So here's a simple query that says find the 30 most recent articles. If we look in the log here, we can see here's the generated cipher query that uh, was generated based on that GraphQL query. It's not quite how you would write it uh, if you were writing it uh, yourself, since it is generated. Um, but we can see if we add more complex fields, so now let's go to all of the topics, give me just the name of each topic for all these articles, and get those back. And if I now look at the Cypher query that was generated, now we can see here's that traversal. So we're only fetching uh, just the data requested in our GraphQL queries. Uh, a bit of an aside, how do we build these database queries um, in these GraphQL engines, I guess is how I think of them. There's a handful of these database integrations. They all work similarly. Uh, basically, by generating resolver functions, the library then inspects one of the arguments to each resolver, which is this resolve info object. Uh, that's passed to every resolver by the GraphQL implementation. And there's a lot of stuff in this uh, GraphQL resolve info object, uh, but it contains all the information about the GraphQL schema and the GraphQL query that's currently being resolved. So essentially what we can do is look at that selection set and kind of iterate through that to build up the database query. Um, if you're interested in that, I gave a talk at GraphQL Summit uh, a while ago that goes into a lot more uh, information about this. Cool, so we're about uh, out of time. I just want to talk about a couple of resources that might be interesting for you to dig in more to this. Um, one is this really cool tool that's out now in beta called the Neo4j GraphQL Toolbox, which kind of allows you to abstract away writing any of the code you need to get a GraphQL server up and running. You can point it at a Neo4j database and we'll generate a GraphQL API for you just that runs all in the browser. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Neo4j ecosystem, we have our online conference coming up called Nodes, or the Neo4j Online Developer Education Summit. So that might be interesting. Um, just some more links, documentation, uh, our online uh, courses. Uh, and then, again, uh, this is linked to the slides in the top right. And then if anyone's interested in downloading uh, the free full stack GraphQL book uh, that is available as well. Cool, so thanks a lot. I think we're out of time exactly, but uh, I'll stick around if anyone wants to chat more. Thanks.